Well, good morning, everyone. I have to say, it's like, that's my favorite time. Like, right there, everyone talking, coffee. I, I love the, just the room energy when that's going on because I believe church is a community and we do this better together. And there is something about just hearing the voices uh, go through uh, this room during that moment. So, um, I'm excited to be here. As I said, my name's Brennan. I think it may be two months ago or something like that, I came down and uh, got to be a, a part of uh, teaching during the gathering. And, uh, you know, I canoed down this morning from Missouri uh, instead of the, you know, the vehicle. It was much faster than I like uh, today. But no, I'm so glad you made it through the rain, uh, torrential downpour, all of that kind of stuff. We need it, but obviously uh, it, it hampers some things. But uh, I am, I love being here. I'm excited about what's going on here. I've, I've been in the church kind of world my entire life. My dad was a pastor, is a pastor, still preaches, um, and you know, from day one have been in it. And, and then for 18 years, uh, was in it like full time uh, in, in the church, uh, kind of Midwest, California, different places. Uh, and, and I'm gonna say this, and I know you're supposed to, but I want you to know like this is true. Uh, is one of the good ones. Yeah. And, you know, exactly. He's awesome. And it is just awesome. Like their heart, Adam, Ashley, the entire family just here for Northwest Arkansas and having people experience the real Jesus. And like, what does that mean? And what does it look like to journey together in that? So it is always a pleasure to be a part of this. And when I get to connect with him about what's going on down here, I'm excited for church in a theater two years i did church in a theater for two years now i'm not saying you're going to be there two years i'm just saying i've done church in a theater for two years and there is some awesome crazy things that happen i'm just telling you okay like you never know that you have those curtains and like with children ministry and people would roll back in there you have no idea what would be stuck to them when they come out so it's amazing it's amazing it's great times trailers stolen all sorts of stuff Great moments of church at a theater. But I'm excited, not just that, but the next step of what is happening through this community to impact the people here uh, for Jesus. So it's going to be it's going to be awesome. Uh, you know, if we haven't met, I'll just briefly say this. Uh, you know, I'm married to an incredible woman named Jana. Uh, May will be 21 years three, a uh, father of three, they're awesome, and I'm a nerd. So there you go, that's everything you need to know about me. But we're in a series called Sink or Swim. And, and a lot of you, when you hear those terms, maybe it goes to like this right here makes me think of a pirate ship, and I was like, do I go R the whole time, or what does that look like? Or maybe it makes, you know, maybe you're in the generation of the parent that just threw you in the pool, right? To like figure it out. It's like you're gonna swim one way or another. You know, and maybe you had that. I didn't necessarily have that. Like, I actually had lessons, and uh, it was great, but my sink or swim, like, childhood moment was actually the high dive. Now, for some of you in the room, you don't realize public pools used to be amazing, okay? And it's all we had in towns of, like, a thousand people. And uh, it was great. It was summer fun. But they had this thing before insurance took it away, is the high dive. <laughs> Yeah, it was amazing. The high dive was like, oh, man. You know, you can do the low dive. That's great for, you know, some of you or whatever. But the high dive, that was the moment. And uh, I can remember the first time being scared and being like, I'm going to land, hit the water, break everything, and I'm going to go to the bottom. But it didn't happen that way. But it was a sink or swim moment. And we all have those in kind of funny, a variety of different ways. But the truth is, in life, we actually have those. We have sink or swim moments that are bigger than that. Because sometimes in life, we just get pushed out, and it's like, what am I doing? No one ever taught me to deal with this. How do we talk about this? How do we actually communicate with each other about this? And there have been some amazing topics, right? I mean, relationships. I think the best thing about life are relationships, but the hardest thing in life is relationships. It's sink or swim. Figure it out. Finances. Anxiety. These are the things that we've looked at, and there's a list of things that it feels like maybe we should have done a better job of helping us learn, the next generation learn about these things, so it's not just sink or swim. 
it's actually it started with at least treading water. And that's what we're just trying to do here as a community. I'm a, a part of Hope City up in Joplin. My family and I, we go there. And so I've been going along with the series, and it's been great. And today, we're going to talk about everyone's favorite subject, and that's politics. <laughs> oh, yeah, everybody, buckle up. Okay, I really do mean buckle up, because I think a lot of you are about to leave. So it's all right. Hey, like, that word is like an energy sucker. I get it. It's like, oh, no, what's about to happen? And half of you are like, oh, this is going to be awesome, and we're going to throw them down, and it's going to be incredible. And the other half of you are like, oh, this is my moment to leave. I get it. I hope it's not that way for either of you. Because the problem is we've looked at politics in a way that it's sink or swim. We've looked at it in such a polarizing way that it's hard to communicate because here's the deal. Everyone just look around. There's a lot of opinions in here. There's a lot of opinions about politics in here. And we all don't have the same opinions about that. But you know what's great about that? Is even with those differences, we can journey with Jesus. Amen. And we can keep the main thing the main thing. And a lot, of, a lot of what we just need to do when we look at politics is say, I know how we've handled it in the past. But how would Jesus have us handle it? And here's the promise. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, who I vote for, anything that has to do with that. Because I don't think that's the root issue. I think it's how do we communicate about it. Because I think we should. And usually a big kickback is like, well, well, I think we can look at what Jesus or the Bible has to say about it, but politics is different now than it was then. Eh, yes and no. I mean, yes, it is different in the sense of now we have like a NASA machine in our pocket that lets us know anything at any time, all the time, right? So I can know about world politics like that. Even things I don't even understand, but I'm reading it. And we can have that. Is that different? Absolutely. But it's not different. Because there has always been, since the fall, flawed humans. And when humans get together and they create a community and it becomes something that's public and something that's governmental and something that is, whether it's an empire or just a town, flawed humans mess up. And that's always been there. Because there's been greedy people and there have been kind people. There's been well-intended and not well-intended. There's been people that are mean and nice and all of the above that are mixed in what this thing of governing and politics since the fall. It's not different. It just feels different to us. And we see it as a polarizing time. We can see it because, again, at any minute, we can say, what, what's going on in the political world? I feel like, man, it is crazy. And it's crazier than it was before. Yes and no. Because I want you to just think for a second about Jesus and, and what he's dealing with uh, during his political climate. Because he is part of the people of Israel. And they are conquered by Rome. Right, Rome has come in, and like their big thing is the Pax Romana, right? The peace of Rome. Like that's their big thing, and the peace of Rome just mainly means we will have peace with you if you let us take over. If you don't, then we'll just kill you. So that's what they're doing. That's what's going on while Jesus is walking and talking and teaching. They are conquered. They are a people that are subject to an empire. And they have religious freedom, but kind of, because they only have it for the moments as long as there's no riots. As soon as something bad happens, Rome will squelch it. So kind of political freedom. But they are in a place and in a time where most of the uproar is like, how do we get Rome out? We are subject to them. And I can imagine the campfire with just the 12. So the 12 closest to him, known as the disciples or the apostles, and they're around the campfire. And you look at the people that are in there, and you're like, oh, there's some Galilean fishermen. 
Oh, there's some people of agriculture. There's some people of business. There's a tax collector. There's a zealot. That's a lot of opinions. And none of them the same. Because that zealot wants to kill all the rest of them because, well, they're participating in what Rome would want to do, especially as a tax collector who everybody hates. And the tax collector is like, well, I'm just trying to make some money here. And I'm going to utilize Rome. Like, there's all of these things. And if they would have talked about politics, they would have disagreed, much like this one. That's okay. Why do I know that's okay? Because it was okay for Jesus. And they walked through it. And they figured it out. And they focused on the main thing. So I think we can. But I think there's some ways that we need to do it. But I am going to make a disclaimer, okay? Because we're talking about something that can get really heated, all right? And the disclaimer is, I might say something that bothers you or offends you. I am not intending to do so. I'm just going to try to look at what the Bible says of how we can engage in politics with each other so that we can be on top of the water. But if I do, I am a flawed human, just trying to follow Jesus the best I can and look at what he has to say. If it does bother you, I just want you to email Adam Barry. And I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I would not do that. No, honestly, this is my email. And it's my personal email. This is actually me, as long as I spelled it correctly. Yes, I did. Hey, if, if something does come up and you are legitimately like, hey, let's talk about that. That's great. Let's talk about it. I love talking about people. Now, if it's an argument, then I don't want to talk to you. Okay? Like, that, I don't have time, and you don't have time. Because I don't think we need to argue, but we can communicate. We can have a dialogue. And even if we come at different opinions on that, that's awesome. Still love you. It's all good. And I hope you love me. But I'm, I'm for real. If something does bother you or you're like, mm, I don't know, just email me. But out of that kind of disclaimer, I want to start with a prayer. Because I think it's important. And I think it's one of the, the prayers that Jesus does. It's John 17, verse 23. It's just a part of it. It is a much larger prayer. But it's very interesting that Jesus, with his closest followers, there's certain things that he has just told everyone to do or them to do, right? Go into the world, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and obey my teaching. Like, there's some universal things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, John 17 is one of those because you know what? Like, if you go through what Jesus said, he never asked you to have the perfect and complete political opinion. Never did. He never asked you to have the perfect and complete theological opinion. Never did. But he did in John 17, 23, pray and ask that we have a complete or perfect unity. And when we talk about politics, I think that's key. Because why? Why would he say that is key? Why is that so important that we have unity? Well, it follows up right after that. So that the world will know the message of him is true. That's why we need to have unity. Even if we disagree, the reason we can stay unified on Jesus and who he is, is so that when we walk out of here, people will see that he is true, he is real, he loves them, and he wants them to be a part of what he's doing. So I'm just going to pray real quick that no matter what we say, or I say, I guess you're listening, that we can have that, though. And there is a better way. Instead of thinking, we can swim in politics. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for who you are, what you've done, and what you allow us to be a part of. I thank you that the church is big and it is worldwide and there's just an eclectic group of people that say we love you and we're trying to figure it out. I pray that no matter where we are in different opinions that come in life, in different ways, in different areas, that the one thing that can stay true is that we are unified in you so that we can go into the world and be an example of who you are and so the people will find you, know you are true, and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So politics, it's crazy. 
All right, we'll just say there's the baseline. It can get crazy. And some of the reason why is we've kind of engaged in it wrong. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about who to vote for, who I vote for, any of that kind of stuff. That I don't think is the role here. What we do need to do is how do we, with each other, with others, communicate? How do we talk about it? How do we get involved in it? How, how do we partner in something that is a part of our lives, it's a part of your life, whether you want it to be or not, it's here. So how do we engage in it? Well, before we can see how to do that well, there's actually a couple of things that get in the way. They hinder, they, they, they're the things that make us sink when we come to politics and following Jesus. And the first is will be up here is Make someone else the enemy. I think this is the primary, if not one of the biggest issues when it comes to following Jesus in the political world. As soon as someone else becomes the enemy, we begin to look at them instead of us. And as soon as we start looking at them and they're the enemy and what they do is and so on, so on, so on, we lose track of what's going on in our heart because we're trying to judge their heart. That's not our job. Our job is to align our heart and our life with Jesus. And it, that can be hard, but it's necessary. Because the truth of it is, there's two things about what happens right there when we make someone else the enemy. We distance ourselves from people. And we put them at an arm's distance. And if anything Jesus does not like is when we keep people at an arm's distance. Because when we keep them away from us, we keep them away from him. And that he does not like. You want to see Jesus get mad? Those are about the only moments he does. Kids are kept away from him. What does he do? He gets angry about it. He says, what are you doing? Why are you keeping them away from me? He goes into a temple and everyone brings this up. He throws a table and he gets angry. See, you can get angry sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Because the religious people were keeping people away from God. He only gets angry at religious people. Read the New Testament over again. It's very interesting. He gets angry. He says, you brood of vipers, you whitewash tombs. All of these to religious people. Why? Because they made things that weren't the main thing the main thing. And when they do that, and when they say that someone else is the enemy or apart from God, and keep them at a distance, he does not like it. We can't do that. The other thing, and the other problem is, we only have one enemy. And that's Satan. Now, I don't know where you are and all that in the spiritual world and, and, and that journey, but here's what I'm going to say. It is very clear that there is one enemy. We can go to Ephesians 6, right, and look at that. It's 11, or, yeah, 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our enemy is not each other. Our enemy is Satan. Now, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he has blinded the world. He has convinced them not to see the glory of God. He is working. He is the enemy. Whoever they is, is not the enemy. If we believe that, we will sink. The next thing, and this is going to come up on the slide, is this is how we engage it. It's kind of a bell curve of what not to do. On the first side is we're never going to talk about it. I don't know if that's you. You're like, hey, you know what? Politics is kind of a little thing. So you know what? I'm never going to talk about it, ever. That's hard. That's kind of difficult. And I don't think it's the approach to go. Because if we just keep our head in the sand and we don't communicate it, we don't get to help people see a better way, a different way. See, we're called to be a light on a hill, right? On the city on a hill. We are this light. We are to show people a different way of life. And that includes in every way of life. That includes politics. We have to be prepared to communicate. Because here's the thing. Often in the political realm, 
we get a lot of worry. We get worry about what's going to happen next. Or what if this person gets elected? Or what if that bill goes? Or what if that law? Or what if, what if, what if, what if? And we worry. And what do we do? One pendulum swing is we don't want to talk about it. And we just worry. God doesn't want that for your life. God wants you to express that. God wants you to bring that to him. God wants you to see that there is hope no matter what situation there is. Let's remember, Jesus is in occupied territory with barely religious freedom. Could be killed at any moment for what they do. And he wasn't worrying about these things. And he did talk about these things. We have to be able to communicate. Now, there's a good way, and we'll go into that. And there's a bad way, and we'll see that. But we have to be able to show people there's a better way than worrying. There's a better way than judgment. And there's a better way than just telling you what you should think. And we have to be prepared for that. Now, the other thing is, and you may know them, maybe you're one of these and you're kind of snickering because you're like, I'm over here or I'm over here. That's all right, because we all are, right? Like, this is who we are. This is humanity. The other is, all we do is talk about it. All you do is communicate about what's going on in the government. That's tiring, man, because I, I get it. You could like 24 seven, listen on the radio, watch on TV, have a podcast. There's a book, there's a news article. There's a, all the things you'd ever want to know about whoever you want to know about in the world. Politics is out there and it can dominate your mind, your energy, your heart and your speech. Let's take it down a notch. Especially, and this is where I will offend you probably, not on Facebook. Let's let that go, okay? Let's not communicate on there like in that way. Bring it down. Because communication about things that can be an issue should be with each other. They can start, like I said, in an email digitally, but they, they should be communicated in life. Okay? So uh, if you do Facebook, whatever, but like just be careful. But we have to make sure this isn't the only thing we're thinking about, talking about, wanting to, to project and put out into the world. We've got to calm that down. Why? Ecclesiastes 5.3 says it this way, that many words makes a fool. It's true. I don't care what it is. I love baseball. I can talk to you about baseball all day long, about people of the past, people right now, people coming up, what stadiums. I've hit every stadium. I'll tell you what I like about them. And you'd be like, oh my gosh, this guy's a fool because all he does is talk about baseball and he won't stop. It's true. Many words makes a fool. We have to know what words to say, how to say them, so that we can help people. Because we don't want to sink and we don't want others to sink. We want to stay on top. So what is that question mark? What does that look like? How do we do this well? Well, to, to see that, we actually have to go to a guy named Daniel. And you can go to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to look at a couple verses if you want. They'll be on the screen. But the truth is, Daniel shows us a different way. Now, let's just set up what's going on again for Daniel. Daniel has been taken from his homeland to Babylon. Babylon has come in and destroyed the people of Israel destroyed Jerusalem, taken artifacts from Jerusalem and said, they are now ours. They are not your gods. They are our gods. And we are going to put them in our treasury. We're going to take your people. Now, we're going to wipe out people that can't make this journey. Maybe they're too old. Maybe they're too sick. Whatever that looks like. And we're going to bring people and we are going to indoctrinate you. And they took the youngest, the brightest, maybe from royalty. And that's where Daniel ends up. And handsome. It says that. That's not me. I don't know. But that's what it says, right? And they're going to indoctrinate them to be of service to the king. It's a three-year process. It's an actual indoctrination school that you are going to learn everything about Babylon so that you can help Babylon thrive. So you need to lose your heritage. You need to lose your religion. You need to lose everything you've thought about before, and you will be us. Now, that is where Daniel is. You know, in, in verse 1, 8, he says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Remember, he, he's trying to follow the law. He has been, things that he can and cannot eat. Babylon doesn't care. With the royal food 
and wine, and he asked the chief official permission not to defile himself this way. How do I know that he has humility? One, he asked. He, he just requests. He doesn't demand. He doesn't yell. He doesn't say, this is the way it's going to be. He doesn't say, you have to understand my side of this. He doesn't do any of that. He says, hey, can there be a different way? Now, you have to understand, this question can just lead to death. Because the Babylonians don't mess around. You don't want to be a Babylonian? Sweet. You can be dead. Like, that's not our conversation in politics. Okay? That's his. And he still, he stands up for what is right, but with a question of how can I help my idea come along? But it has to start with humility. It reminds me of a, a group I'm in up at Hope City, and we meet at Tuesday nights, and we're learning uh, about how they, like, to be better at counseling. And, and how can we help people in the process of counseling? And, and the, the guy who leads this has been a therapist for a long time. He has all the background. He knows all of the things. He, the books, the techniques, all of it. And the, he sits down, and we come together, and his big question is, what can you teach me this week? Now, it's not generic. It's meaningful. Like, he means it. The expert comes with humility. If you want to dialogue in anything that is controversial, if you have an obstacle, if you want to talk about politics with someone who has a different opinion, if you want to go in and be the change, start with humility. It is what will lead us through the way of Jesus. Now, there's, that's just the base the next thing that we see in Daniel is always have respect. Here's where Facebook gets a little crazy, okay? There's a lot of not respect going on. We gotta stop that. It's just a basic human right to respect another person. Everyone deserves that. See, we always think, well, they didn't earn it. I don't care. I'll just say it. I don't care if they didn't earn it. They deserve it. Jesus would see it that way. Daniel sees it that way. You go through the list of the people we should model our lives after. Paul being thrown in prison for no good reason, whipped, beat, all of these things, and still shows respect. We have to respect. Because those are going to help those conversations. Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's your own family, and it's at a Thanksgiving dinner that can get real crazy. You know what I mean? But having respect for the other, we have to see this. We see this in uh, verse 12. See, Daniel is trying to have this agreement to say, let's change the food. I don't want to defile myself. And he says, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. See, he has respect for what they're doing. He's not saying, you need to change your whole program. He's not saying Babylon needs to do this differently. He's just saying, hey, please, for us, can we do it a different way? For 10 days, just test us. Is that okay? Comes with humility, shows respect, and asks the question. See, respect has a lot of questions, not demands. Because when we ask questions about the other person, about the other idea, of maybe how they got to that idea. It shows a respect and a value to them. It doesn't mean we have to agree with their idea, but it shows a respect. And when we can show respect, it helps lead into the conversation of sharing our own idea, maybe even one to help bring about a turn of opinion, and maybe repentance if it actually involves sin. We see that in 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says this, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge and the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil. 
See, there's different ways, and this could be with false teachers, this could be with different opinions, this could be with politics, this is a sin that's there, whatever that is. With respect and gentleness and kindness, we die alone. That is the way that Daniel would do it. That's the way Jesus would do it. To help. To help bring people. What, what does it say in the Bible? Kindness leads to repentance. Not yelling. Not screaming. Not attacking. Kindness leads to repentance. But what else do we have to do? The other part of it is some of the conversations are actually to get somewhere in a conversation to persuade. Now, just know I said persuade, not convince, not prove you're right, not question everything about them. Conversation to persuade. And just so that we have the same basic understanding, persuade is this. Provide a sound reason for someone to do something. I'm not making them do something. I'm not saying they have to do this something. I'm just giving some pretty good and sound reason to do this. Now we see in Daniel 1, that 12 again and into 13. So he's asked, right, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables and to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with the other young men who will eat royal food and treat your servants accordance to what you see. He's just saying, I will give you good sound reason. Give me 10 days. Let me just show you. This can be better. It can be different. We don't have to do it this way and go against our God. Sometimes we have conversations and we think they're to persuade, but they are actually just to degrade. Let's not do that. You want to know how to do that? Again, it's with good questions. I, I had a pastor that I worked kind of for and with for about nine years. And he was smart. And he had, I mean, honestly, like, you know, he would go and speak places, wrote books, like all of this kind of stuff. But you know what he would do when there was a difference of opinion? He would say, hey, I just want to know how you got to that. And it wasn't judgy, it was honestly... He had all the reason to say it was going to be a certain way. But he would just ask him, say, hey, help me understand. Why is it that you think that? Or you did that? Or you, so that he could have a better understanding of my experience, my thoughts, and my reasons. So that he could, in gentleness and kindness, say, well, what if it could be a different way? And it wasn't manipulation, like it was, it was authentic. If we could have authentic ability to ask the question, how do you get there, so that we could have a conversation to show good reason, it could change the dynamic of what people think or feel or experience when we talk about politics. And the truth of it is, in conversation, we also have to know when to end it. You ever been in a conversation where it's like, this isn't getting anywhere, and we may just be escalating the situation? Hey, Jesus said this. Okay, this isn't to offend the other person, whoever it is, because sometimes I've been that person. It says, don't throw pearls to swine. What does that mean? You don't need to give something that's really significant and try to prove in this good, precious thing to someone who's just going to trample it. Understand that. And know that sometimes the conversation just needs to be like, hey, I think we're not going to get anywhere right now. I love you, but we're going to have to stop. That's okay. Conversations to persuade are not to convince. It's just to help along so that we can keep the relationship and model God at the same time. So what's the next thing that we see is ultimately we need to trust God. Daniel did this, right? He trusted God. And, and we see that as it comes to the end in uh, chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. At the end of the time, set by the king to bring them into service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so that they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and chanters in his entire kingdom. 
I mean, it worked. They did something, and ultimately Daniel trusted God that God would do what needed to be done. And that's a powerful lesson to learn, especially in in a time of maybe conflict, in a time where maybe we see the political landscape as crazy. Not, I would say, as crazy as Daniel did, but crazy of just ultimately trusting God. We see him do that again later. There's the lion den. That's what Daniel's mostly known for, right? There's people against him, and they decide, you know what? We are going to create a law. We'll have the king do it. You can't pray to your God. But do you know what Daniel does? He still prays to his God. But do you know how he doesn't do it? In the street yelling at people. On the corner yelling at people. Trying to convince everyone that they should do the same thing. No, he goes to his house on his own in quiet, and continues to follow what he's convicted to follow. And God ultimately delivers him. It doesn't work out for him, right? He gets thrown in the lion's den. But God brings him out. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to trust God is in control. No matter what. Because there's been a lot of bad political systems. And uh, Paul was a part of one. And he says this in Romans 13, 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except the one which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now that in and of itself is a lesson on its own, but what I want to say is sometimes we don't know what's going on because God has a bigger plan. And we have to trust. Daniel modeled that. It went well. It went poorly sometimes. Jesus models that. Obviously, it went well, and it went real poorly real quick, but it was the will of the Father. And he can turn anything that is negative into a positive. He can redeem any situation, any person, anything that we go through, including politics. Now, I know that this just is like the tip of the iceberg in this subject, and there's going to be a QR code up there with other resources. If you want to know more actually about Daniel and what he went through in the political landscape of Babylon, there's actually a resource on there, a book, Larry Osborne. It's incredible, and it may even help you have some peace in our own time, because I get it. It's election year, and things seem to get crazy, but God is in control. God is here. God is with us, and he has a better way to help us keep the main thing the main thing. And on things like this, that maybe we were just sent out into the world and we didn't have any kind of training or help to dialogue on, there is a way that we can communicate and we can engage in that's healthy, helps us, helps them, and shows God. Right now, we're actually going to get really practical and just go into a time of prayer. And this is a moment that happens uh, every week around here. And it's a significant moment that we can stop and just reset. And honestly, some of you, maybe it's a a time to stop and reset uh, about the subject. Maybe even just the word politics has brought something up in your heart that you just need to release to God. And say, this is yours. You are in control. Or maybe there's something going on in your life right now that's significant. And maybe, you know, it's a mountaintop and you just need to praise God right now. That's awesome. Do that. Or maybe it's a valley and you need to give that to God. It's also an opportunity that for those of you who say, you know what, I'm all in and I follow after Jesus, that we get to remember his death, his burial, his resurrection. But his death in the way of of taking the juice, taking the cracker, and remember that he gave it all for us so that we could then help the world see who he is. So right now, I'm going to just start it with a prayer, but give you a moment to reset, to focus, and to pray. Father, we thank you that your love is great, that it is bigger than any of us that right now we give you whatever is on our minds and hearts.
that we lay it at your feet and know that we can trust you with it and you are in control. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your